the Vietnam War was a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, in my Air Force life, I had several almost devastating experiences uh, or setbacks. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, but you can't show weakness. And over time, you know, you see your, your, your uh, pilots that you were having lunch with, uh, lunch with the day before, and now the next day they're gone. Uh, and and then being in communication with a, pi a down pilot on the ground, and uh, your jets are strafing the area, and the helicopters are are uh, are firing, and you're in communication trying to get that pilot or and uh, or pilots out of the jungle underneath the canopy, and then when when the conversation goes silent, yeah. you know you lost, and that's that's pretty tough. So there were a lot of great experiences, but there was a number of uh, very, very negative experiences. And again, as an alpha person, I didn't want to show weakness. Yeah. Didn't want to show weakness. Welcome to the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. You guys all know me. I'm your host, Yuma Barnett. And today I'm coming at you from another strangely named town in New Mexico. Yesterday it was Pie Town, New Mexico, or last week if you're watching this. Uh, today we're in Camado, New Mexico, at the Camado Cowboy Church. And I'm interviewing another cowboy over here, the pastor of, of the Camado Cowboy Church, Dr. Gary Knuff. And I think I said his name right. Even and it, it, He said it perfect, enough Knuff. So if this gets long, I'll just say enough Knuff and we can cut it off. Is that right? Work? That's good. Uh, but uh, Dr. Knuff, he's been the pastor here for a while. He's got a, a very you know detailed background that I'll let him get to, into in the corporate world and then as a pastor and as a speaker and as an author. And uh, he's also a veteran uh, of the Vietnam War, uh, served in the Air Force, and I won't hold that against him. We, you know, it's easy to give those Air Force guys a hard time until you need a bomb on target, and then all of a sudden they become your best friend. Sure. But I'm uh, excited to have him on the podcast today. I won't monopolize the microphone anymore. I'll pass it off to him to introduce himself, and we'll get into that conversation. Well, my name is Gary Knuff, and um, I, I appreciate your podcast. It's really excellent. Um. I was born at a very early age in Seattle, Washington, and uh, grew up on the streets of Washington and uh, graduated from Ballard High School in Seattle there. And of course, the Vietnam War was going on, and uh, you're, you may remember it was in all the newspapers. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so I enrolled in college and couldn't find a job to pay for my tuition. And my draft number was nine. And so my dad always said, uh, my son is a draft dodger <laughs> because I enrolled in the Air Force. I figured they had better duty and better food. And I didn't want to be a ground pounder. Right. You know, so. And you're right on both accounts. They still have better living facilities, better food, a and better duty, right? Uh, uh, you're always jealous when we go to an Air Force base and we say, why the heck did the Air Force get all this fancy stuff? And us grunts in the, in the Army don't. Right. Uh, but we're going to get right into the, the topic and the, and the reason for this podcast and, the, and its key word there and, and vulnerability. And, and all your years as a pastor and as a service member and as a husband and a father, I'd just like to know what your definition of vulnerability is. Well, vulnerability is uh, making a choice to be transparent with people and to be able to let your emotions out, whether it's happiness or sadness or uh, what, whatever the emotion is, to be able to express that. And most of us, we start out suppressing that. Yeah. And, uh, and it t we have to go through some things to where we'll be honest with ourselves and honest with other people yeah. and just uh, have the freedom and the liberty to be able to express those emotions. Yeah. And, and why, there's a lot of reasons why that's important and the catalyst behind that. But w what do you think kind of, what's a for good first step into being able to do that? Well, <clears throat> uh, I think it's, 
I think it's uh, taking it out into the light and looking at, you know, what am I doing here? Am I suppressing everything? And if we, if we contain all that and push it down, then eventually something's going to trigger. We're going to be offended by somebody or something, and then we explode. Right. Um, and uh, so I think it's important for people to be able to uh, let go of all that negative energy. Yeah. And uh, if you suppress it, it's going to come out yeah. in ways you may not like. Yeah, I agree. And I think, and I don't like your opinion on it. I think it starts, you got to have first have honest conversations with yourself and good self self reflection and, and you got to be vulnerable with yourself right. first before you can be vulnerable with others. Is, is, what do you think of that? Yeah. Well, when I grew up, you know, a man wasn't supposed to shed a tear. Right. You had to be tough. You couldn't show any weakness. And uh, I was uh, the alpha type. And uh, uh, so you had to be tough and you, you know, basically my, most of my life I, I lived in adrenal response, uh, fight or flight. Right. And of course that damages uh, your physiology and, and other things in your mind and uh, in your body. And uh, that adrenal response, uh, it, it, you know, basically it breaks you down as a human being over time. Yeah. Yeah, and then before you started uh, working in the corporate world and doing uh, all the ministering, you did join the Air Force and, and served in, in Vietnam. What did, what, was your serv what did you do in the Air Force, and, and what was your service in, in the Air Force like for you? Well, um, actually, the Air Force was fantastic most of the time. And as an A-type person, I was driven to achieve, and wherever I went, rise to the top, whatever that is. Um, and well, one of the great things today is that, uh, well, in the past, the, the Air, Air Force, the veterans program, paid for all my tuition oh, yeah. for my degrees and everything. And then also, um, I in the corporate world, you know, you have uh, your your insurance, uh, health insurance and then in as a veteran you you can go to the VA hospital like they say who gets uh, a second chance to give their life for their country right. by going to the VA hospital <laughs> but what I found is that uh, in these especially in these past several years at the it was uh, that the uh, the medical care at the VA hospital surpassed what I was receiving in the corporate world yeah. like I won't mention the names, but <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then um, uh, the Air Force experience uh, was good and bad, and of course, <clears throat> uh, the Vietnam War was a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, in my Air Force life, I had several almost devastating experiences. Uh, or setbacks, and then, uh, and then, um, uh, but you can't show weakness. And over time, you know, you see your your, your uh, pilots that you were having lunch with uh, lunch with the day before, and now the next day they're gone. Uh, and and then being in communication with a, pi a down pilot on the ground, and. Uh, your jets are strafing the area, and the helicopters are are uh, are firing, and you're in communication trying to get that pilot or and uh, or pilots out of the jungle underneath the canopy. And then when when the conversation goes silent, yeah. you know you lost, and that's that's pretty tough. So there were a lot of great experiences, but there was a number of uh, very very negative experiences. And again, as an alpha person. I didn't want to show weakness. Yeah. Didn't want to show weakness. So you spent, uh, I think we talked six years in the Air Force. Is that right? Yeah, six and a half, almost seven. And yeah. uh, 365 days of that were spent over in Vietnam. In Southeast Asia, yeah. yeah. And you spoke about a little bit the rescue of the down pilots and uh, and stuff. What exactly w did you do? What was your your mission for that 365 that you were over there? Well, <clears throat> the Air Force, they sent me to Fort We Gotcha or Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Yeah. 
and uh, and there was like ten of us Air Force guys, and it was, and we were mixed in with the uh, the uh, uh, Army Airborne and uh, Green Berets, and and we were kind of kind of rebellious. <laughs> uh, everybody, uh, we got we got in trouble because we didn't. You know, we were Air Force. We right. didn't want to do everything, everything, Nothing's everybody changed. else. Yeah, and so uh, we learned how to how to seed sensors uh, from uh, helicopters, Hueys, and then uh, call in airstrikes and all that kind of thing. So then, uh, when uh, I was sent overseas, uh, it was pretty phenomenal. We seeded the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the lifeblood for the Viet Cong, uh, uh, taking ammunition and vehicles and, uh, and, and into, uh, uh, into South Vietnam. And so we seeded the Ho Chi Minh Trail and we had different uh, sensors. We had acoustic sensors that would, like a parachute, they would hang in uh, the jungle canopy and you could hear uh, the engines, or you could hear people talking, or uh, going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We also had seismic; they looked like rockets with fins on the back and points, and and we seismic um, sensors. And uh, so uh, we would use three or four different sensors and an algorithm of how long uh, the how long the uh, 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 the trucks were from the first time they they set off to the last time they set off, and also uh, troops. How 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 many troops are going down the trail? So then, what we did is uh, we called in airstrikes, um, called in airstrikes on those trucks, and uh, F4s, F111s would just uh, wipe out a couple hundred trucks a night, and. And computers were new at that time. And so there was a uh, computer data link that was developed uh, because the Soviet MiGs, the MiG-21s, were out uh, flying RF-4s, F-111s, and, and our jets. And so they, somebody developed this computer data link out of, uh, and it was out of Task Force Alpha. And they were able to, uh, to reduce the number of uh, aircraft loss uh, from using the computers to project what that MiG was going to do oh, wow. and how to evade the MiG. And that was all new stuff uh, back then. And so, um, but, you know, the biggest challenge was uh, we knew, um, we, we knew that we were, that we were not going to win this war unless we unless we could uh, take it uh, to the source, which was China and Russia. And uh, Kissinger, of course, was in the Paris peace talks, and uh, they the, he would meet with the Viet Cong and and uh, uh, and they would talk and talk and talk, and then eventually they. They have a ceasefire. Well, so we would ceasefire maybe for two weeks, while uh, Hanoi replenished yeah. all their SAMs and uh, rockets and anti-aircraft uh, ammunition weapons, and so you know it was really a losing thing. And and one of the tragedies, you know, you you gave it your best, you gave it everything you had, and then when we dropped, when we when we left Vietnam, we left billions of dollars worth of equipment and friends, and um, and I, I and millions of people were killed in the next 12 months after after the peace treaty. So all that gets to your persona, yeah. uh, your thoughts, your emotions, and again, you're not supposed to express that. Yeah, so obviously the Vietnam War not popular back here at the stateside while you're over there for your for your year long tour. How, how cognizant were you of that that you're fighting an unpopular conflict, or are you just so focused on the mission that you <coughs> kind of try to put that out of your mind? Well, 
Well, uh, yeah, I think you know we'd run our uh, we'd run our uh, sorties and everything at night. We'd sleep, come back to the hooches, sleep in the day, hundred degree, hundred and five degree temperature, ninety five percent humidity, and uh, you 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 are focused on it, and you're you're thinking about life. And for me, as uh, as a person of faith, you know, I when when we, when we flew over there and it was like a cattle car, <laughs> uh, we were just stuffed, you know, in this uh, jet airplane and. Uh, uh, for and on the way over there, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a man of prayer and meditation, and and so, uh, and I was a person of faith, uh, and I felt like no, no bullet uh, could enter my chest except God allow it. So I was going to be okay with that, um, and I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid, but uh, then as things went along, I did develop fear. Yeah. Yeah. So looking back, if, if you look at the Vietnam War and the, you know, the Afghanistan War, which I was part of for 20 plus years, uh, there are some similarities there. And the, we left, uh, you know, you can debate whether we won or lost, but it was a draw at, a, at, the, at the best, in my opinion. Left millions of dollars of equipment, a lot of lives lost over there. Um, we didn't come home to the terrible reception that you guys did, but we kind of came home to a silent no reception instead of a negative. It was just kind of, it's over now. Mm -hmm. how, how did you deal with that? You spoke before, you couldn't even wear your uniform. Yeah, around. in those days, you, you couldn't wear your uniform yeah. uh, stateside unless you were on the base. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, people would spit on you and yell and scream and, and call you baby killers. Yeah. Um, and and so that, uh, that was a tragic thing. And I think one thing that really bothered me is here I was in this negative situation for 365 days, just trying to survive and help my buddies and, and uh, crew to survive. And so when I came back, the world had gone on just as it al always had. And, yeah. and, and it's like, don't you know what's happening? Yeah over in these places, and so now you gotta come back and assimilate. Yeah, yeah. and then, so how do you, do you rely on your brothers that were there with you? You obviously relied on your faith. How did you get through those, that, you know, that first year, or two years that you were back stateside? Well, uh, I was a very angry person because I was angry at the government for putting me in a bad situation where mm -hmm. You know, you have rocket attacks, mortar attacks, and snakes. <laughs> yeah. And you'd be coming down a trail, and here's a, a, a cobra comes yeah. up. Yeah, send a rocket at me any day. Yeah. A cobra. And, and everybody's trying to, the first guy that sees it, he's trying to climb over everybody to get away from it. You don't know what it is until you find out. And, and then... Um, and then the green vipers and snakes, all kinds of snakes, two steppers, you get yeah. bit, two steps and you're dead. And um, so I couldn't believe that my government put me in such a horrible place for such a terrible reason. Right. We, were, we were stopping communist aggression. Yeah. That's what they brainwashed us with, told us we're stopping communist aggression. So I came back to the States and went to the Oregon State Fair at Salem, and here's the Communist Party booth. Uh -huh. at, and, and, uh, and I was angry. Uh, I was angry, uh, I was fearful, loud noises, uh, you know, and, and I, I didn't wanna deal with it as PTSD. I didn't wanna deal with it as uh, a residual, a negative residual from my military experience and, um, and I didn't, so I stuffed it. And I didn't, uh, I didn't know that it was doing, what it was doing to my relationships, to my wife, to eventually my children, because that anger just kept playing out until I had to deal with it. Yeah, right. And what did you find, what, how did you deal with it? Well, <clears throat> uh, I actually read a lot of books and uh, enrolled in um, 
classes uh, for psychology and counseling and different things like that. And, and I think what I was trying to do was, uh, uh, was help myself, doctor myself, and uh, then I ended up with so many credit hours in that particular field of psychology and counseling and that kind of thing that I, I had to go on and, and finish my doctorate and all that because I had so many credit hours. And so I did a, a lot of education. Education really helped because it kept me busy, it kept me focused, it kept pressure on me. Yeah. And uh, then, um, then, of course, church. Church uh, helped a lot. And uh, just uh, and being being in a church where there were a lot of uh, military members, captains and colonels and different ones, and that we could talk about these things. Yeah, you got to find your 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 group and 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 talk about it. That's the key is is to get it out there. Yes. Yeah, you had some rough days in service, rough days in Vietnam, but. There's got to be some positives to it. What did you gain from your time in service that kind of you kept with you and carried on? Well, what I learned in the military was discipline. And that's why, I, you know, I, I look at these inner cities and these poor people that are trapped in the concrete, concrete jun- jungle, and I think, listen, you know, go in the military. They always have a need for people. Go in the military and learn some discipline. And so here I was this alpha type, and I needed the discipline to achieve, whether it was in business or whether it was in college um, and life. And so what I received from the military was discipline, which I applied to my life. So always starting at the bottom, climbing to the top. Right. And I think you hit the key there. It's a lot of people would... It's one thing to learn it. It's one thing to practice it, right? You learn the discipline, but you retained it and used it for the rest of your life. Yes. So uh, that's probably one of the keys to, to it right there. And uh, I'll say, you know, to transition out of the military space um, into your civilian career, 35 years as a president and CEO in the, in the corporate world, um, what, about, what are those military traits and those traits that make somebody successful in, the, in that environment? Well, again, I think it's the discipline. I think it's the drive. Um, I learned, actually, um, out of my military experience and making that transi- transition, I learned what I call the miracle of motivation. And uh, the miracle mo- motivation is how do you take s- yourself from where you are to where you want to be? And actually, that part I didn't learn in the military. Uh, I learned uh, in desperation trying to cope with the transition into civilian life. And so I had to learn this miracle of motivation. So I started reading books, uh, listening uh, to tapes, and just saturating my mind with how I could achieve. Uh, Because I had all this negative in me. I had this fear. You know, you you hear a helicopter, and boy, you know, it just sets you back for a little while. And uh, so I had to learn how, uh, am I going to live in my depression, or am I going to achieve? Right. And I think you say something, and you've said it throughout, is the power and the the importance of lifelong learning. Yes. Continuing to learn. uh, do Do you feel the same way about that? Oh, absolutely. I think I have 365 credit hours or something like yeah. that. And I've always, uh, I've always been learning. Wherever I went, I would take classes and, and, uh, uh, and study Seattle Pacific University in Seattle. And then, uh, uh, then uh, there was a, a Bible college called Puget Sound College of the Bible in Seattle. And so I was strengthening my faith but at the same time, I was experiencing this miracle of motivation because when I was in school, I was a C student because <laughs> I just didn't care, you know. But when I got out of the military, I had a whole new motivation to succeed, and so I went uh, to being an A student yeah. because of the miracle of motivation. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I was a, uh, I tried to get out of out of as much work as I could when I was a high school student, but then when I went back to college about three years ago that motivation and that 
that drive I gained from the military really helped me be successful. And, uh, you know, in the military, we, always, we talk about kind of work-life balance and how to, with the deployments and the training cycles and everything <coughs> you have to do, it's hard to achieve work-life balance, which I don't think you can achieve. I think it's the pursuit, always trying to achieve, you know, making sure you're at least attempting and I think it's probably the same in the in the corporate world and as a pastor, there's a, you're getting pulled a lot of different ways. How did you try to achieve you know work life balance in, in your career? Well, uh, as you say, it's very difficult. You know, I you know I can't imagine today when military guys are deployed for six months or a year, whatever, whatever their deployment is, and they have to be away from their wife and children. That puts so much stress on a marriage and uh, on a wife and on those kids. Uh, it, it's just uh, a terrible thing. And so, uh, and, and what, I, what I ended up doing was, um, uh, bec uh, because I was a good speaker and I became a vulnerable speaker. Yeah. Um, and so, but I spent a lot of time, I, I actually at one time was speaking 22 times a week, uh, either in the church. 22? Yeah. Oh, wow. In the church and on radio every day, and then uh, traveling, flying out uh, for a, a conference to speak at a conference for two or three days, flying back into to town. Uh, I'd, I'd always bring presents for uh, for the wife and, and the children, and um, but it took a toll. It really took a toll. And so I was traveling so much, and I, I guess I've spoken publicly over 10,000 times uh, on TV, on radio, in churches, in camps, in uh, secular colleges, uh, uh, secular schools, uh, Christian colleges, um, uh, corporations, that kind of thing. So. And actually, I, as I de developed the vulnerability, I found that people were hungry and thirsty for it because it made them feel alive. And, uh, but, but here I am, uh, you know, traveling and speaking all over and, uh, and then popping the uh, penicillin because I had sinus infections and, and uh, uh, throat infections and I, and I have lung disease and so you know I'm living on the edge right and for a long time and uh, uh, eventually that had to that that eventually it broke me down right. and uh, you know I remember uh, you know I would do gigs uh, uh, like uh, for uh, 2,000 executives at the Disneyland Hotel and I was the only one uh, on the schedule that got a standing ovation. You know, if you can make people laugh, if you can make people cry, uh, if, if you move people, not to manipulate people, not at all to manipulate people, but to lift people up and encourage people and make them feel alive. And uh, so, and, and, and eventually, uh, you might it broke me down and I had a series of strokes. Oh, wow. And I was in the hospital for a week. I couldn't speak. I couldn't walk. I couldn't think. Uh, I was in bed uh, then for a couple of months, uh, flat on my back. And I always have been an A-type, you know, moving and shaking and make things happen. And now all of a sudden, all I could do is look up to heaven. <laughs> and uh, so that stress, that stress will kill you. Yeah. And... Uh, so I had to regroup, regroup. And that's one of the reasons that we moved to uh, Catron County, New Mexico, is because it's such a beautiful place. And, there, and I grew up hunting and fishing. I lived to hunt and fish. All week long, yeah. I'd think about it in school <laughs> and dream about it. Yeah. And uh, if there was something to fish for or something to shoot, that's where I would be yeah. with my dad. And uh, so, you know, we live in this beautiful Catron County, New Mexico, where there's only 3,500 residents and there's 35,000 elk. That's right. And so it's a wonderful, peaceful place to downsize your life because right. you can't keep it going like you once did. Right. So to, to say, I mean, you kind of moved away from center. 
probably this and God, God recentered you to yes. you made a living speaking and doing things. Yes. And all of a sudden that was gone. Couldn't do it. He got moved back to center. Uh, yes. Um, I think people just need to make sure that they listen to their bodies. They listen to their, their spouse. Uh, they, the signs that their kids are, uh, getting more distance uh, from you, uh, when you, you, cause you, the profession, military or speaking, can become can, can become an addiction. Yes, you can get addicted. I loved going. I loved deploying and getting on a helicopter every night and flying to Target, but I didn't realize until yeah. years later when my son said, "You know, I'm done with this." Yeah. I, I, and I had to remember that it wasn't about just me. I, you know, it was about uh, the yeah. Whole, the whole running family. those missions is exciting. Yeah, and fear. You know, it's scared. You know, it's, there's fear, but. Um, but you overcome that yeah. with the excitement and the and the goal and yeah. So, with that, you know, I always ask my military guests what their most challenging day was in the uniform, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've had some of those. But I, I don't get a lot of perspective sometimes on what your most challenging d time was to somebody that was on the corporate side for as long as you are. What was your most challenging day or the, the kind of aha moment where you knew you were drifted from center and needed to come back that that you can recall? Well, um, you know, military guys, you go, man, this is crazy. I don't want to do this. I'm out of here, you know, and I'm going to go in the corporate world and achieve. Well, there's a lot of backstabbing, <laughs> and this, you know, and people, uh, uh, people just uh, are people. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I found like I. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I was president of this company, and um, one of the uh, one of the people uh, kind of circumvented everything and caused a lot of trouble. And I here I am on the telephone, you know, yelling and screaming at this guy and cursing at him. And that and, and again, that was my anger mm -hmm. from my PTSD and back to the military service. And I, I, I had a number of occasions like that where I just said, wow, man, you were over the top and you just had this meltdown. And so, uh, you know, in the military, you know, that's an easier answer. I remember, well, several things. I went through a hurricane, was trapped in an ice cave with no light, um, <coughs> um, injured my back, uh, <coughs> uh, jumping out of helicopters and, and, uh, and also in the hurricane thing. And then, and then in Southeast Asia, and I, I was in this field one night, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the jets were strafing the area, F-111s, F-4s. I have a, uh, I have a friend uh, that was an F-4 pilot, and I, I said, and I said, wow, I said, I salute you because that – Flying F-4s was the workhorse uh, of the military back then. And he says, yeah, I killed a lot of trees, he <laughs> says. But so I'm in this field one night, and the jets are strafing the area all around me. There's fire, there's the concussion and all these things, and the Jolly Greens are firing their, their miniguns, uh, and the tracers actually looked like lasers. Yep. And all this was around me. And uh, at the end, to, to force the end of the war, we were sending uh, B-52s uh, to Hanoi. And uh, the B-52s might be 20, 30, 40, 50. B-52s all converging on Hanoi and literally burning it to the ground and of course they'd s send up their MiGs, uh, anti-aircraft and MiGs and uh, and we would lose sometimes two, three B-52s in the night. So I'm in this field and all this is going on around me and all of a sudden I see a B-52 returning from Hanoi and it's on fire. The whole thing is on fire and all this junk off the B-52 was just falling all around me as it came over, right overhead. And man, that, that was the first time I was afraid. And I feel like God spoke to me there 
and said, Gary, you get your heart right with me tonight or you're never going to see your family again. And I, it was just a still small voice. I got down on my knees and I asked God, please forgive me and, and please help me. And, um, and I thought I was going to die that night. And that B-52 continued on about another nine miles and then crashed into the jungle. Um, luckily, uh, which I don't believe in luck, but uh, luckily um, the crew bailed out in that instance. So that was, a, that was one of many. Uh, and it's how many years ago was that? Let's see, that would be 50 years ago. And you can still recall that like you were in that field again. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, that's, uh, that's, some, that's some powerful stuff there, Dr. Uh, so right now, if uh, somebody's transitioning out of service, um, you did it a few years ago, uh, and going into the corporate world, what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, educate you know, your MBA or um, whatever, whatever area you want to go into. And then um, examine yourself as to what you li your likes and dislikes. And I believe, uh, y you know, we all have different temperaments. We all have different education. We all have different IQs. And the worst thing you can do is come out and be a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. And so what we do is we find an occupation or we find a company, and then we're trying to fit into that thing when we're not, we're not uh, programmed for it. We, we don't have the ability to achieve. And so, um, and so in some of my seminars, what I do is I say, find out what you love to do yes. and then monetize it. Find a way to make it pay. Yeah. Say that again. <laughs> Find out what you love to do and how you're geared, uh, what you absolutely love to do, and then find a way to monetize it, to make it pay. Yeah. Um, and that's so important because it's a terrible thing to be in the corporate world uh, and hate your job every absolutely. day. Absolutely. And I ask you to say that again because that's what I tell every transitioning service member I talk to is you got to know yourself first and what you want to do. And, and then, you know, you want to be if you want to be happy in all aspects of your life, you got to not go to work. You just got to go somewhere for eight hours a day and then, and then come home. And, 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 and that is, it all starts with understanding yourself. And you spoke about uh, during your Father's Day message when I was here in the church, uh, being a, a man of courage. And I, I want you to just uh, tell us what that, what that means. Well, we all want to be courageous. We, we sing songs about it. We watch movies about it, TV shows. But uh, there, I think there was a book called uh, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And I read that, and 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 by the way, uh, I I read uh, I read books on how to overcome fear, how to overcome anger, uh, how to overcome the anxiety, and I didn't realize really when I came out how broken I was, um, because I didn't want anybody to know that I was depressed. Right. I, and so uh, so I would read books and take classes and for, try to fortify myself in areas where I was weak. Uh, but then again, um, I find that uh, fortify yourself in some weak areas, but really magnify your best areas yeah. and focus on that so that you can achieve. And um, I probably got off the question there, but. <laughs> that, that's, that's okay. Um, and transition on with, to a different topic about you being a, as a husband and a father. And, and I learned something about you uh, during the, the, the service uh, a couple of weeks ago is you're, you're, you're a dad and, and you went through probably a, one of a parent's worst fear, you know, is to outlive one of your kids. And you had a, a daughter that passed uh, some, some time ago. And uh, you've dealt with loss in Vietnam. Uh, you and now you had to deal with loss as a parent. Um, 
uh, how did you get through that time? Well, and I think that's a good point. We all go through loss in life, and you must overcome the loss. Um, and w when you lose a child, you never forget it. It, it will go with you to the grave. Um, but what happened was uh, uh, I had uh, just <clears throat> dropped my wife off at the Albuquerque airport. She was flying to Seattle-Tacoma because our son and daughter-in-law, our, our daughter-in-law was pregnant, and she was due, you know, any hour, any day. So my wife, she flew there, and when I got home, when I got home, I worked out, and uh, I was all alone on the ranch, which, you know, which was fine, beautiful ranch. And uh, I received a call from my uh, son-in-law, and I thought he was joking. Our, our family, we love to laugh and joke, and, 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 and I think laughter and humor is very, very powerful to overcome the negativity. Yes. Um, and so my son-in-law and my daughter, my youngest daughter, Gracie, they called, and my son-in-law <clears throat> said, Alicia, our daughter, she was 41, Alicia has had a massive, a massive heart attack and has died. I thought he was joking. I, I couldn't believe it. And what had happened, she'd had a seizure and had a pulmonary embolism. And uh, I just started to sob. I couldn't stop sobbing. And, and Gracie and Richard were on the phone from Oklahoma, and I just kept sobbing. And so I couldn't believe it. This can't be true. It's so surreal. How is it, how is it possible? And I... I had to spend the night, and I had blood pressure problems, and I kept checking my blood pressure, and I just uh, grieved, uh, just unbelievable grief and sorrow all night long there on the ranch alone. Nobody else was there. And so the next day I had to drive uh, to Albuquerque, three-hour drive, and I'm weeping as I drive. And I go up to the t ticket counter uh, in Albuquerque, and all of a sudden, I just broke down weeping. I, I just, for, I, I said, I'm sorry. I said, my, my daughter just passed away. And so I get on an airplane. And actually, there was a military guy on the airplane sat next to me. And, you know, we're making small talk and all that. And, but, man, I'm having trouble controlling myself. And so then I, I actually shared that with him. And, uh, I mean, just overwhelming. And he actually, uh, in Dallas, he actually escorted me to my next plane. And so, so then I had to, you know, deal with all that, uh, you know, all the medical stuff and all the, all the funeral stuff and picking out a casket and, and grieving and dealing with the whole family, all the kids gathered together and grandkids. And, and uh, an interesting thing is that the very hour that our daughter Alicia passed away. Our, our, our grandson, Ezekiel Knuff, was born that same hour. Oh, wow. And so here's Susan <clears throat> with our son. Uh, there, and, and actually, they're by uh, Joint Base, uh, you know, Fort Lewis and McCord Air yeah, Force McCord, Base. Yeah. He pastors a church, <clears throat> uh, has a lot of military people in the church and retirees. <clears throat> so Susan was taking care of the kids, and, and, she, and our daughter-in-law's in labor at home. Susan knows what happened. Josh, our son, knows what happened. They can't tell uh, Natasha, our, our lovely uh, daughter-in-law. But the very same hour, Ezekiel Kenuff was born. Wow. Yeah, it'll shake you to your roots, to your, to your core. And it took me a long time to even deal with that yeah. emotionally because every day a song, a word, uh, steps that you walked up together, yeah. it just hits you. And I'll ask one more question that's in that same vein. So the, 
the gold star families out there, you know, the gold star mothers who had to go through that too. Is there, you know, I'm sure your faith played a huge role. Um, and yes. I, and, you know, I know some of these gold star families and they're still struggling years and years later. Um, what's something like, what advice would you give them? Well, and I don't want to be inappropriate, but the first thing is you come to God through Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, that's that, not inappropriate. That really, really helped me. And to know that as a believer in Jesus Christ and my daughter, my daughter was a, a beautiful, beautiful gal, and she sang incredible voice, and she'd sing, she would sing in ensembles and, you know, church um, uh church choirs, different things like that. And so I found a lot of solace in prayer and meditation and communication. All, as, as it turned out, our kids all became pastor's wives and pastors, and uh, which was an amazing thing to me because it was totally different than the life yeah. that I grew up. You always want it better for your kids. Absolutely. And um, so I, I think it's your faith. Yeah. You know, you can talk tough and all this kind of stuff, but boy, when you hit rock bottom, it's your faith. It's like you've, it's like you've bumped all the way from the front of the, uh, uh, the front seat all the way to the back, and you back, you've bumped out of the back seat, and you're just holding on, you know, yeah. tie, a, tie a knot and hold on. That's faith. And I think, you know, it, it, we're specifically talking about loss here, but I think that's, uh, that's in all phases of life. Yes. And in all difficulties that you're going to go to, you're going to need faith to help you get, to get through it. And I, I just thank you for sharing that. I know it's, it's not easy. Uh, I appreciate it. And, I, and we'll, we'll circle the field here and we'll land the plane on my question that I ask everybody, because I'm always curious, uh, what would you do or what advice would you give that 20-year-old uh, Gary uh, if you could go back a and talk to him? Well, <clears throat> you know when you graduate from high school, you think you've arrived, yeah, but absolutely. you really started at the bottom again. Yeah. And so um, in this thing of vulnerability, you know, just be honest with yourself, be honest with other people, and, and, uh, and really seek, what, what am I supposed to do with, uh, with my life? What am I geared for? What am I talented about? And, and should I go to college and, uh, and earn degrees, you know, MBA or whatever in business, or should I go to plumbing school yeah. or, or mechanics uh, or, you know, and... Um, or should I go into the military? I think so many 20-year-olds uh, have, have no direction. Uh, they have no vision for their life. And in the military, it can be a very exciting thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you can grow emotionally. Uh, and, and remember, your prefrontal cortex is not fully de de developed until you're 25 years of age. Right. So be very careful about your decisions. Right. Yeah. You know, so that's what I would say. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And uh, I'd, I'll say thanks for doing this. And I'll say thank you for your service. Well, thank you for yours. I mean it. Uh, you guys got the raw end of the deal when you came home. And uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, thanks for all you do here in the Catron County community. Um, we uh, love it. And uh, just thanks for coming on here and uh, appreciate your, uh, your vulnerability. You bet. Glad to do it, Yuma. Yeah. And for all you out there watching and listening, do all that good stuff. Watch, share, subscribe, uh, send me a note, uh, ask me questions, whatever. I'm open to talk to you, uh, recommend guests, uh, whatever it is. Or if you want to come on the show and share a story, uh, uh, let me know. Thanks again, Doc. Uh, appreciate it. You're and, very uh, welcome. We'll see you guys uh, next week.